Okay, we're going to get started with uh, reading our first story of the week. Uh, we're going to get started with reading Phyllis's Big Test. But before we start reading, I want you to go ahead and skim through the text yourself and ask yourself, what is the genre of Phyllis's Big Test? Remember our genre-based thinking job questions for each of the genres. So if it's poetry, which I'm pretty sure we know it's not, uh, what's the literal meaning? What's the figure? Our deeper meaning? If it's nonfiction, what is the big topic? What's the author teaching us? And then what's the point of view? And then if it's fiction, um, what is? Who are the characters? What do we know about them? What is the problem that these characters are encountering? Um, how are these characters trying to solve this problem, or what's the solution to the problem? And then what is the big lesson that the author is trying to teach us? So take about twenty more seconds to skim through the text and try to figure out what the genre is. All right, many of us probably have gotten to the conclusion that this is a fiction text. Um, one, there are characters. Um, two, there are plenty in, plenty of instances where there is dialogue between those characters. And we know that when we see those, those are our big clues that that's a fiction text. Um, so before we start reading our fiction text, we want to make sure that we have our genre-based thinking job questions in mind for fiction text. So once again, it's who are the characters? What do we know about them? What's the problem? What's the solution? And then what's the lesson learned? So as we're reading, I'm going to stop uh, periodically so we can take notes on each of those um, uh, questions that we have. So give me one second. All right. So Phyllis's big test. Phyllis's big test. Make sure you're on paragraph one while I start reading. One crisp early autumn morning in 1772, Phyllis Wheatley was crossing the Boston cobblestones with a sheaf of paper held tightly under her arm. <clears throat> her master, John Wheatley, offered her a ride to her examination, but she preferred to walk. She would make her own way to the public hall where a group of men would decide once and for all, was she or was she not the author of her poems? So ask yourself now, um, who are the characters that we've met so far? And what do we know about them? So it looks like we've met Phyllis so far. Um, what do we know about Phyllis based off of these two paragraphs? While we keep reading, we're going to keep taking notes on Phyllis and what type of person she is, what's motivating her. <clears throat> Paragraph three. She had spent recent evenings copying and recopying her poetry in her own neat handwriting. She knew every line, every syllable by heart. She wrapped the pages tightly in a roll, pages of poems that had come from deep inside her and could not be taken away, no matter the, out, that, the outcome of today. Still, she had something to prove, not just because she was young, not just because she was a girl, but because she was a slave and came from Africa. Stop there. Jot down any more notes that you might have. Who are the characters? What do we know about Phyllis? What is the problem that Phyllis is facing in this story? All right, picking up at paragraph five. She could remember little about crossing the Atlantic and even less about her African homeland. She was just shedding her front teeth when John Wheatley bought her on the Boston docks as a servant for his wife, Susanna. They christened her, their new slave, Phyllis, the name of the ship on which she arrived. Her first winter in Boston was so very cold and awful. She survived only by the kindness of her masters, especially the Wheatley's twins, Nathaniel and Mary, who eager, eagerly shared their lessons with her. They taught her not just English, but Latin and Greek. Stop there. Jot down any more notes we might have about who the characters are. What do we know about them? Maybe we get a little bit more evidence about what the problem is. Paragraph 7. 
It was those lessons that led her to where she was today. As she began to read poetry, glorious sonnets had inspired her to try her, ho- her own hand at writing, and soon she was reciting her poems to the Wheatley's friends. She stayed up late night after night preparing for the examination. The previous evening, her mistress Susanna had taken away the candle at midnight and said, tomorrow you will look them straight in the eye as you answer all of your questions. Your talent will speak for itself. They will discover the poet we know you to be. And when your book is published, everyone will know. Books had opened up a whole new world to Phyllis. And as she taught literature and ge- as she was taught literature and geography, she was memorized. She memorized the names of cities and countries, list of kings and queens, and dates of discovery. Over time, she had come to appreciate her own time and place, her very own role in the chain of events stretching from past to present. She did not know why she had been brought from Africa to Boston or why she had ended up in the Wheatley home but she knew that she must now make the most of her opportunities. She, had, she must make her voice heard. She was not content to recite her verse in drawing rooms or read one of her poems from a newspaper. She wanted her own book because books would not just last a lifetime. They would be there for her children and her children's children. She hurried by the book seller shop that she visited weekly. Today, Phyllis did not have time to step inside and smell the leather bindings. Maybe soon she would visit and find her own name on a volume. All right, take a second, jot down any more notes we might have about what the problem may be, any more notes we might have about who the characters are and what we know about them. How are these characters trying to solve this problem? Okay, we're going to finish up. <clears throat> Paragraph 13. But because, uh, but she must first pass this examination to make her dreams come true. There would be only 18 gentlemen. She had often entertained as large a crowd in the Wheatley parlor. This group, though, would include the governor, the lieutenant governor, famous ministers, and published poets, all learned men. Many had studied across the river at Harvard and knew much more than she did. Phyllis felt a chill as she neared the building. She started to turn away, but then Susanna Wheatley's words echoed in her head. Your talent will speak for itself. Phyllis slowly mounted the steps. She would face her examiners, not just for herself or for the Wheatleys, but for her family back in Africa and for her new brothers and sisters in America, who deserved their own poet. As she turned the handle on the large wooden door, the sunlight framed her entrance. She moved into the hall as all eyes turned toward her. Good day, gentlemen. I am the poet, Phyllis Wheatley. Jot down any last minute notes we might have about the character, problem, solution, and now what is the lesson that you think the author is trying to teach us? 